out next week. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Power Podcast All Star Live Streaming Series. We've just been having a phenomenal and historic time here with you all. We want to thank you all for tuning in uh, two to three times a week and sharing this message with your family and friends. And so we want to encourage you to still do that today. We have an exciting show today, a very informative show, uh, a lot of information that has been going on with the lending process and everything with the PPP program and all of those things. And so we knew it best to bring to you uh, one who has his fingers on the pulse of what's going on in Washington, DC and what's going on with literally hundreds of black businesses and banks all across the country. So we're gonna get ready to get started. But what I need you to do right now is right at the bottom of this video in the comment section, I need you to go ahead and tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, do that real quick because we're ready to get going. We got a lot of information to share with you. I need you to like this fan page, like George Frazier's fan page, follow the fan page. And then the other thing I need you to do is go ahead right now and share this, uh, this momentous event, right? This is critical information. We need to share this right now to every entrepreneur every business owner, every family member that you have that is in the position where they're needing funding for their business, they need access to capital, they need to be on right now listening to the expert that we have for you today. And that is Ron Busby, who is the CEO of US Black Chambers. So we're bringing him to you live right now with Dr. George C. Frazier. Also want to remind you to go ahead and mark your calendar uh, for this coming Tuesday. We have the one and only Dr. Randall Pinkett, who's coming up Tuesday. We have Michael B. Roberts coming up next Thursday. And so next week, we're going to have a full plate for you again to digest a lot of information, okay? So do me one more favor. Again, go ahead and like it, but I need you to share it. Really share this video. This information is timely. The votes just went down yesterday, the day before yesterday, and we wanna make sure that you have this information in a timely manner before this, these funds are dispersed next week. So without further delay, I want to introduce to you some, uh, of course, reacquaint to others, uh, our host for this evening, the one and only Dr. George C. Frazier. Thank you, Brother Bedford. A host is nothing without a co-host, someone, <laughs> someone who's got the technological back, the administrative back, uh, and uh, will, will, will also uh, ask intelligent questions uh, and backfill and just be a really, really great partner. So I, thank you. Thank you again, Brother Bedford. You are a real, real champion and uh, a, 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 a real support system. I would deeply appreciate it. Uh, it's Saturday night, and I ain't got nobody. I just, just got some money, and I just got out of jail. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> well, if you consider it home jail, because <laughs> I'm not at home right now. I'm in my office, and this, this, is, this is my office. So this is my escape plan at least three times a week. My wonderful wife of 47 years is getting a little sick of me. Okay, because I've not been around this much, right, 24-7. Uh, so uh, this gives her some space, gives me some space, but most importantly, it provides us an opportunity to hear from some of the giants, some of the thought leaders, some of the mover shakers and decision makers in our community. And we have such a person on tonight. He is not only a thought leader, he is also a good friend. I've been knowing Ron Busby. Uh, I don't even want to say how long, right? I've been knowing him because it'll give away my age, right? And it'll give away his age too. Um, but but he's an incredible brother, a successful entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial history and past himself, uh, has committed his life uh, to and his time and his talent and his treasure uh, into the investment of our people and taking on the awesome uh, responsibility of leading up and growing the U.S. Black Chamber. Um, he is based out of Washington, D.C. He's right in the mouth of the lion. 
and uh, he has his fingers uh, and his brain power invested and involved in all things black upward mobility and entrepreneurship. Um, the mission of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is, 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 is quite profound. It's profound in its simplicity. Uh, the U.S. Black Chamber, and I'm, I'm just reading the mission statement, uh, mission is to provide commit, committed, visionary leadership and advocacy, underlying advocacy, in the realization of economic empowerment through the creation of resources and initiatives. The U.S. Black Chamber supports African-American chambers of commerce and business organizations in their work of developing and growing Black enterprise. Uh, that is easy to say, extraordinarily difficult to do. And uh, a person that has committed their life to do that kind of work with our people, with all of our challenges and picadillos, I think is saintly, I think is anointed. Um, and we are better because of them. And uh, so I want to introduce to you, if you do not know him, if you're a business person, you should know him. Um, Ron Busby. Ron Busby, welcome to our podcast. And it looks like, you know, it looks like you are the chairman of a Fortune 500 company in that presentation that you're making. You're all suited up on Saturday night. You are always suited up. You're always clean as a hotel chitlin, man. You know, you just... You just look like you got money. You're managing money. You are. You're. You're. You're helping others to manage their businesses. To manage. I mean, you just look the part. You also sound the part. You act the part. And um, we went. I was just with you well, about a month or so ago. Well, it was a little bit more than that. It was before this uh, yeah. in Prince George's County at um, uh, our friend. Um, Nicole. 50th birthday party, right? Correct. Uh, oh, yeah. And, it, and we just had a lot of fun. Just we a did. Lot of fun. So good to see you. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing well, George, man. I am truly, and I, I don't say this lightly, man. I'm honored and really humbled to be here with you. I have followed you over these last few weeks, and man, you have had a true lineup of <laughs> iconic leaders, speakers, and man, so for me to be on here, man, I, I'm just excited about the opportunity. Um, I'll tell a story. I, uh, I ran the Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce prior to coming to Washington, D.C. And the first hire I made, and really the only hire I made, was a young lady by the name of Heather Holmes. And mm, Heather, Heather Holmes, and, yes, yes, yes. And worked for you. Um, and shortly after she got hired, we were planning on our conference of sorts in the Phoenix Black Chamber. And she said, well, you got to have George Frazier come down and speak for us. And as big of an, of an individual as I was in Phoenix at the time, you just took it over the top, man. To be able to have you come out and speak to our audience really gave me a boost to go on and do bigger and greater things, man. So I am always uh, thankful to you that you allowed me to, to join you a few times at your national conference. And most, uh, the few first few years, I just sat in the, you know, behind the scenes and just watched you guys operate. And it really gave me a vision of how to uh, ultimately become the U.S. Black Chamber and do what we're doing today. So again, I thank you for all of your leadership and your mentorship uh, for allowing me to be on this afternoon as well as all that you've done in my life. Well, th thank you, ma'am. This, um, this is your moment. This is your time. All eyes are on you, as you can imagine. What I want to do is to... to, to to give you full justice, so to speak, is you have, there's, I have a little bio here of you and, I just, and it has some interesting and important background. I'm gonna follow up with a question uh, after this short read of the bio, but people need to know about you. I, I did not commit it to memory and I wanted to do it right. So I just wanna do it, I, I, just, wanna, I just wanna do a short read. Uh, Ron Busby Sr possesses a wealth of business management skills and strong, a strong commitment to serve black business owners. I think I got that part right. Ron is a former successful business owner himself and has been recognized as one of the nation's best CEOs. 
Ron grew up, uh, grew his first company, um, his first company, USA, super clean from $150,000 in annualized revenue to over $15 million in only 10 years. Early on in his career, U.S. SuperClean was recognized as the largest Black-owned janitorial firm in the country. Mr. Busby has also started and grew two other janitorial firms, both resulting in over $4 million in annualized revenue. So he is teaching what he has practiced. Having a successful track record as an entrepreneur paved the way to establish Ron Busby as an influencer in the Black business community. Trained by some of the country's leading corporate executive, Ron Busby developed his skills at some of the nation's largest corporations to include Exxon, Xerox, IBM, Coca-Cola, and uh, Coca-Cola USA. While in corporate America, he was recognized as the National Salesperson of the Year. Mr. Busby's leadership and philanthropic efforts to support Black-owned businesses has led him to be recognized as the advocate of the year by Minority Business Development Agency, as well uh, as named as Man of the Year by Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity for his philanthropy. Currently, Ron serves on the board of Bowie State University Foundation, the Bayou Classic Committee, Pfizer Small Business Council, National Newspaper Publishers Association Foundation Board of Directors, Essence Festival, Entrepreneurial Advisory Committee, that's one sentence, the FCC Broadcast Diversity and Development Committee, Businesses for Responsible Tax Reform, Small Business Administration's Council on Underserved Communities, and is the founding member of Blackwell 2020. Finally, a native of Oakland, California, and he graduated with honors from both Florida A&M and Clark Atlanta University. Ron has dedicated himself to the empowerment of black business, of the black business community. And Ron is a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, father of two sons, and currently resides in Washington, DC, the metropolitan area, and a little bit of personal thing. Uh, He's single. <laughs> Ron, welcome. Welcome. Thank we have a man. very large, we have a very large black female audience. It's typically 65, 35, right? Well, so I don't know if you're looking or anything. I don't know who's looking, but I, you know, I just have to put that out there because I'm about hooking a brother up <laughs> and for the right sister, hooking a sister up too, right? So let me, um, let me just start with, with, with some basic questions about Ron Busby. Tell us um, about your journey on how you became the CEO of the U.S. Black Chamber. Considering, I mean, you had phenomenal business success and you sort of did something with that. I don't know what you did with that to take over this responsibility, but unpack that for us. Well, I guess, um, wow, uh, I, I start off by saying that I was blessed to have both a mother and father. I grew up in a home where I had both my parents there. And I tell the story that my mother um, is a teacher, so she, was, she made sure that we were well educated and she's a minister. So we had a church home, so I was a preacher's kid, so I always say uh, I'm well intelligent, well, well educated, and I also know my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And usually people say, ha ah, great accolades, love the kid. But then I also say, well, I also had a father and my father was an entrepreneur at his own business for most of our lives. And he was a Black Panther. So I say, uh, okay, I'm about yeah. my business, but I don't take no shit. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I have been in a family where Black pride, uh, the ability to move an agenda well with inside the box. Because I think when people think about the Black Panther Party, they just think about black leather jackets and afros. A lot more and than that. And there was so much more than that. Uh, it really was about, about an economic agenda for our communities 
represented by us and also understanding advocacy, understanding the law and what was legal versus what was not legal. So you very saw, seldom saw them getting in trouble even with uh, the parades that they put on because they were well with inside their rights. And our parents made sure that we understood that. So from a very young age, I saw us advocate for our issues, educate us. I have an older sister that's a doctor. Uh, her and her husband, both are doctors, uh, went to Howard Medical School and live in a little small town in Alabama. I have a younger sister that's an attorney. Uh, we all understand the importance of making sure education was at the forefront of our lives, but pushing an agenda to move black people forward. So uh, came up uh, in Oakland, went to a different high school, a different school every year, because my mother was like, that's the best second grade teacher, so you're gonna go over there, she's a black teacher. <laughs> we'll move schools, go to that school over there, because that's the best third grade teacher. Uh, so I went to a different school every year, um, wow. because we wanted to make sure that we got the best public education that we could get with inside the scope of what was legal. Now today, that's mm -hmm. not legal. You can't go with outside uh, of your school boundaries. But my parents understood what was flexible, what we needed to do in order for us to be successful. My father worked a full-time job at General Motors uh, and then came home and did his janitorial service on the side. He had five employees, my mother, my father, my two sisters, and me. That was his company. Uh, he grew that firm every evening after school. He would come home. Uh, I was running track and doing all kinds of athletic things. Got home, you did your homework. He dropped you off at a building that was your building. That was your responsibility to clean it. He picked us all up and we went home together as a family. We worked in our family business. Um, I was fairly good SAT score, PSAT score. And I remember uh, going to Stanford University my junior year in high school, getting ready to go off. And they said, hey, uh, there's a program at Stanford University that you can participate in uh, in anticipation that you would come down and be a freshman year. And I remember my first day, they said, look to your left, look to your right. One of you guys is not going to be here. And I said to myself, well, I don't want to be here if you don't want me to be here. And I picked up my bags and left. And I made the decision to go to Florida A&M. Mm. And I remember at Florida A&M, they said that first day, look to your left, look to your right. Get to know each other. These are the future leaders of, the, of this country. Go into business with each other. Get married. Have children. That was a family environment and I knew I was at home and I knew that I was going to always have to live like that in order for us to be successful. As I said, right. uh, I worked in corporate America quite a while and was always doing fairly well, but I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And my last corporate job was at Coca-Cola. Our largest client at Coca-Cola Fountain Sales was McDonald's. I knew mm. quite a few McDonald's franchisee owners that were black that were doing extremely well. And so I decided, well, I was going to look into becoming an entrepreneur as well. I remember when I was at my job in corporate America, there was a gentleman that lived down the hall or that worked down the hall for me. And let's assume his name was Joe. He was a white guy, he was 56 years old. And Joe came to work every day at nine and left at five. I got to work every morning at seven and I didn't leave until seven in the evening. And about four or five months into my career, uh, my supervisor called me in the office and said, Ron, we want you to pack your things. And I thought they were getting ready to let me go. And I was like, you know, what am I doing wrong? And they said, nothing. We want you to move to Joe's office. And I said, well, where's Joe going? And they said, Joe's going to be reporting to you. That day, I mm. said, I got to get an exit strategy. Because I didn't want to work another 30 years. I was 27 years old. Uh, I didn't mind working 12 hours at 27 years old. Joe knew his customers. He knew the business. He was successful. He worked from nine to five because that's what he had to do. Uh, but when they said Joe was going to work for me, most people were excited for me. I said, no, I got I got a plan to get out of here. So then I went to work at McDonald's in the evening from eight to midnight. And I mm. learned what it was like to be an entrepreneur. I learned what it was like to manage other young people that were making minimum wage and working at school and working this as a second or third job in many cases. And so I understood what it was going to take to be a successful entrepreneur. I took that uh, understanding and knowledge, took it back home to my father's business, and uh, I grew it from, like you said, $150,000 a year to becoming one of the largest black territorial firms mm -hmm. in the country. I, how did you give, I mean, how did you give that up? I mean, that transition, 
from a very successful entrepreneur to advocacy, basically. I mean, that's really at the highest levels and yeah, advocating yeah. for us, but yeah. that's a huge, that's, that's a huge leap. Well, I ended up getting there a uh, couple of ways. The first way, um, I ended up reading a book, uh, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re Reginald Lewis. Uh, Reginald Lewis. And right. I had a vision board that I had created, created that I was going to double my firm every year. Uh, so to go to from 150,000 to 300 is not that tough. To go to 300 to 750, okay, you got a few city, state, government contracts. Uh, went to 750,000, got a couple of commercial contracts. I got to 750 to 1.5. Uh, ultimately got to 3 million, became 8A certified, which was a program set aside for the government businesses. Right. I got there and became $7 million and did not know how I was going to double. Ended up finding a firm in San Jose, which is now called Silicon Valley, that was doing janitorial service in the tech industry. They weren't letting any black businesses participate. Uh, after reading the book by Reginald Lewis, I decided, well, I'm going to buy a firm. I'm going to find the right firm that had all of the requirements that I was looking for. I spent about six months finding the right firm with the right clients. I knew everything about this firm. I had made several offers to who I thought were the owners of the firm only to find out that they were just the nephews of the owner. Finally reached the owner on Thanksgiving Eve and he said, oh no, those are just my nephews. I own the firm. He said, I've been trying to figure out what to do with it. And I said, but I've been writing letters and I, this is before email. So I was faxing letters. I was putting letters in FedEx packages and driving it down there to them so that they would open it up. I was trying to be creative and doing all the things that I read in your books. Uh, eventually said, if you can come down in the next 45 minutes, I'll give you a, a, an opportunity to tell you your story. I drove down there, of course, of about uh, three or four hours. We negotiated, went through all the numbers. I ended up buying his $7 million firm for about $350,000 plus one additional payroll. Got a $7 million firm for a little less than a million dollars, and I was wow. off and running. Got to about $15 million, and I had the world's largest uh, janitorial service, American Building Maintenance, which was in San Francisco, and they eventually acquired my firm. And I then ended up becoming an employee of theirs, and that just didn't work for me, George. I had put oh, no Thanksgiving way. dinners on people's table. I had grown people's businesses uh, independently, and now all of a sudden I'm like a parent, and I can only uh, really uh, just kind of take care of your children uh, they're not your children anymore. Uh, you can just babysit them, but you can't spank them. You can babysit them, but you can't hug them. And I just felt like uh, that was contradictory to everything I had done to grow the firm there. And so I ended up walking away, moving to Phoenix, Arizona, because I had a non-compete uh, that I couldn't do business anywhere I was doing business currently. And I wasn't doing it in Phoenix. Moved to Phoenix, loved Phoenix. Wife ended up dying in the process. So me and my mm -hmm. two sons, uh, ended up moving to Phoenix, Arizona. And I got involved because I just wanted the network of other black businesses. And after my wife died, the chamber gave me the opportunity to lead. And I made the commitment then that if they committed to me during the process, then I would commit back to them uh, once I got through the process. And so uh, ended up becoming the president of the Phoenix Black Chamber. Uh, we had a a Democratic governor, Janet Napolitano, who was close friends, uh, was the first governor to come out to endorse then Senator Barack Obama. He liked to play golf. Uh, I liked to play golf. We had an opportunity to meet uh, and I supported him. Uh, and he said he would not forget us. A lot of people say things he didn't. Uh, there was a need for a new voice for black businesses in Washington, D.C. So we started the U.S. Black Chamber in March 2009. At the time, we had about six chambers. Today, we have over 145 chambers in 42 states, plus Canada, Durban, South Africa, Morocco, and just uh, signed an MOU with, uh, the, uh, with Congo um, in Africa, and over 322,000 Black-owned business members. So it has been a, a great ride. Uh, I can't say that I would have envisioned it. But George, I know you believe in vision and you believe in saying things. I remember praying uh, on a Friday night saying, Lord, I know there's 
more for me. I felt like Satcho Page. I was like, Lord, if you just give me one more inning, I know I could do it. I just didn't feel like Phoenix was the last call for me. Uh, and when I got the opportunity, the next morning I woke up and I got a phone call from a mutual friend of yours and ours who has passed now, a guy by the name of Aubrey Stone. And he mm -hmm. said, Ron, we're thinking about opening up and starting a new black chamber. And we want you to go to Washington D and start it. And without hesitation, I moved to DC uh, with my sons and it has been just a tremendous ride. Uh, and How I many really years? feel How many years now? How many years now? It's been 11 years uh, last month, March, 2009, yeah. That's right. Mm. And so, um, the role of the chamber, the role of the chamber, and where where would you like to see it, let's say a decade from now? I know it's inch by inch, but yeah. a decade from now, what, if you could wave a magic wand, where, where would the chamber, what's the role of the chamber, and what what where do you want them to be in a decade? So to answer the first part of the question, the role of the chamber, I remember when I first came to Washington, D.C., uh, and we have these double-decker buses, and they give you bus tour. It was right in the middle of the winter, uh, and I remember riding on the back of the, of the bus and looking down at the license plates of our cars, and it said on the back of the tags, taxation without representation. And I thought to myself, that's what black folk have been. We've been paying into a system that has not represented our best interests. And so the role of a chamber primarily uh, is based on what we call our five pillars. And the first one is advocacy. I have learned that in Washington, D.C., it really is about your voice, what you represent, and being true to that voice. When I first got here, I remember uh, where we were officing, there was a suite right across the hall from us, and it was the Sugar Beach Growers Association. Everybody has somebody lobbying for their best interest, except for black business owners. We've had great is organizations. Is, is lobbying another word for av advocacy? Pretty yeah. much. It's a fine line because lobbyists get paid to do exactly that for a particular industry or business. Advocacy is where we represent a policy concept, a constituency, a, a mission, and we advocate on behalf of that. Very close, but a thin line. Um, but the U.S. Black Chamber's first and foremost mission is advocacy. Um, I was a business owner in Georgia. I know you talked to a lot of business owners and their number one concern for all business owners is access to capital. Sure. But you have a black business owner, they will take, say their number one, number two, and number three concern is access to capital. And in a situation like what we're going through right now, advocacy and access to capital are extremely important. And I think we'll spend a little bit of time this afternoon, this evening yeah. talking about our third one is really, if you ask everybody else what they want, they say, I want a contract. I want to grow my business. And so we look at that from where is the government spending its money and how we can make them do better. Where is corporate America spending its money and how we can make them do better. And then most importantly, George, where are black people spending their money? And I know you have a lot of passion about that. I know I've been with you and Maggie Anderson to talk about you know, the back black dollar. Usually we talk about the trillion dollars of black spends that African-Americans have, but that usually not us talking about it. That's usually white people saying, black people got a trillion dollars. How can we market to them to make sure that they get their share of that? We're saying we have a trillion dollars. How can we keep that in our communities? How can we develop our communities with that trillion dollars? You know that uh, if we did that, we'd be the 15th largest economy in the world. We just got to be able to give tools and resources for black people to do that. I grew up in Oakland and there was an MLK street uh, and a Malcolm X street. Every Saturday you could go and find businesses to shop at. And that's what my parents did. Today, we just have to use technology, but we can still do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our fourth one is entrepreneurial training. And it amazes me that the average size black owned business is $74,000 a year. And what happens is people say, I'm a great baker. I, I have a great, uh, I make great soul food. I'm a great barber. I'm a great uh, seamstress. 
and they say, I want to go into business for themselves. And they say, great. But they never continue that education. 90% of businesses have no continuing education. But the 10% of businesses that are doing above a million dollars, I'm sorry, 100% of the firms that are doing above a million dollars with that 10%, all of them have continuing education. They're all either taking some kind of online class, face-to-face -face class, they're listening to online presentations like this, they're reading, they are always educating themselves because they understand what they learn to open the door is not going to be enough to keep the door open and most definitely not enough to drive more people in the door. And so we say entrepreneurial training is extremely important. And then our last one is chamber development. Uh, again, when we first started, we had six chambers. Today, we have over 145. And I always say, I'm only as strong as my weakest link. I'm only as good as the smallest chamber in the country. I need to make sure that they have the resources, knowledge, and relationships that they, have, that they need to be able to move their communities forward. So mm -hmm. that's the role of a chamber. Uh, in 10 years, I'd like to see the Chamber of Commerce be self-sustaining, meaning I don't have to worry about corporate America making philanthropic donations. I want us to be able to have our own revenue streams so that Black people are supporting Black people so that we can have even more freedom to say and do what we need to do without anybody else hindering we're using leverage over us. And so if that means that we need to create our own CDFIs and our own banks and our own businesses, and we need to be making sure that we're supporting one another, that's where I see the future of starting in the U.S. Black Chamber. And secondly, I think our voice can even be more impactful here in Washington, D.C. in reference to policy uh, to get across the country things that are important to us around the country. Um, what would be... Um the status or the state of black businesses in America? If you were to give a, a state of black businesses um, micro uh, report, what, what would it be? I mean, uh, how would you assess it? How would you assess its health? Is it, is it, um, is it on oxygen? Is it, um, uh, is it out of, uh, the, the, the modern fetal stages is it growing is it healthy what do you what do you see you have your fingers on the pulse of it what, what, what's your feeling about it you know george and you've heard the president mention this a lot we had a great economy prior to covid 19 um and we did it but black america are black, are blacks benefiting from that i mean real on the real yeah I, I think we were, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and I'll first I'll give you a story. I was at uh, the transition meeting when, when Trump was coming in and Obama was leaving. And they bring all of their black organizations in together to meet with the black leadership team of, of the new president, new administration. And I remember them saying, in essence, black folk, you had your turn. You had a president for eight years. Uh, so whatever you were going to do, you had your opportunity to do it. Now it's about women. And I was, remember at first I was thinking, well, I'm offended because I'm a black man who is representing black business. So why would you say that it is just about women? But then I left the meeting and I thought, well, we got sisters and wives and daughters and nieces. We need to think outside the box and say, well, let's support and figure out what are the advantages that women businesses have and make sure that we're taking full opportunity for all of those. So I say that to say women businesses, particularly black women businesses, were doing extremely well during this last period of growth. Uh, when I started the US Black Chamber, there was 1.9 million black owned businesses. Uh, today, there's over 2.6, almost 2.7 million Black-owned businesses. So the growth has definitely occurred in reference to the number of Black-owned businesses. I was part of the leadership team of an organization called Black Wealth 2020. And we had three primary initiatives. The first one was to increase the number of Black homeowners by 5 million by the year 2020. And we're very close. Uh, the second one was to increase the number of Black-owned businesses businesses from 2 million to 4 million. That was the goal. We felt like we had- uh, over, over what period? 
this was 2014, 15. So we were saying we we're going to give ourselves a five year run rate to try to capture these goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were doing fairly well tracking. Uh, and we were also going to double the revenue of those firms. So at the time it was 75, $75,480 was the average annualized revenue for black owned business. We wanted to double that to 150,000. What has happened is the growth rate of the businesses is still there. The annualized revenue has actually decreased. So it's went from 75,000 to roughly 55,000. Mm. But that's because most businesses don't start January 1st. So that amortized uh, revenue, you may start November or December, and you're only going to have one or two months worth of revenue that's got to be amateurized. So we don't know the new numbers in reference to revenue for black businesses, but I will say uh, we anticipate losing somewhere between 35 and 40% of the black businesses due to this pandemic. When wow. we come. They just simply won't return. Simply won't return. Yeah. Um, I, um, so this is, this is, I want to ask you this question and still be loved, and I want you to be transparent, honest on it. Because there's been criticism that um, uh, President Obama, who I love, did, has not done as much for black businesses as Donald Trump. Is there any truth to that? I, first off, let me say, um, I think what a president does is he doesn't direct contracts to a no, particular no, sector. Not at all. He creates a mood and an atmosphere where it is good to do business with a particular sector or industry. And yes. what President Obama did was made it very uh, feasible for black businesses to have success uh, because I think our voices were appreciated. Uh, I think the country was more inclusive and diverse. Uh, I can't say that for this administration. Uh, I can say uh, that under this pandemic, and I'll say this, um, under this current CARES Act and all the stuff that you've been hearing about, you will never see the words black or African-American. No. This was a small business piece of legislation. We had to fight to actually keep it race neutral because we had a president that was such a racist that he was calling the pandemic a China flu. Uh, so the Asian community was out front saying, if there was any type of set aside, if there was any type of love given to one nationality, they needed it the most. And we said, wait a minute, I understand you guys are having issues, but we've been ha having issues for 400 years. So there's no way we're gonna let anybody get in front of us uh, on any particular case as it relates to uh, funding this country, so we kept it as small business. That was the first wave of dollars. In reference to Donald Trump doing anything more for black businesses, I can't say that he has. One of the things that we wanted, particularly in this piece of legislation for black businesses, is many of our successful businesses are doing business with the government. But the government is a notoriously slow paying entity. Yeah. You can get a contract on June 1st and may not get paid till September 15th. Black businesses don't have the float to be able to carry the government's accounts payable. So we said, well, we wanna make sure that we re-implement the quick pay, prompt pay, which was implemented during the Obama administration. If you invoice June 1st, you were gonna get paid June 15th which was extremely important to small and black owned businesses to now be able to have, I got cash flow. I don't need a line of credit uh, from a banker. I can cash flow a business myself. I can grow. Uh, I have the flexibility to make sure that I hire a need uh, and can get the supply chains that I need. Um, this administration did not see that as being important. Um, we also know that under this new TPP status, uh, we fought to make sure that small businesses that we own, you could write off or you could incur the cost of a 1099 employee. Many black businesses, if you look at the 2.7, don't have employees. There's only 120,000 black owned businesses that have 
I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Well, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of you can't write that expense off. You know, you can't include 1099s in your payroll protection program because the whole concept is we wanted you to make sure that you kept your full-time employees paid. Well, black businesses do a lot of subcontracting and a lot of 1099s, which was detrimental to our small businesses being able to participate in the payroll protection grant as well as the idle loan. So I can't say that this administration has been more friendly uh, to black businesses by any stretch of the imagination. And I will also say this, part of the challenge is the lack of transparency and accountability from the federal government. You can ask the federal government how much money they have spent with Asians, they will tell you they don't know. You can ask how much they spent with women, they can tell you the exact number. How much they spent with veterans, they can tell you the exact number, and Native Americans. But you ask them how much they spent with black owned businesses or Hispanic owned businesses, and they'll say, well, that's discriminatory. We don't keep those numbers. To me, that's ludicrous. There's gotta be accountability. If you're gonna say that any administration has done anything better than the previous one, you gotta tell me what the previous one done and what you've done as well, so that there's some metrics involved in that conversation. And right now, there is none. Mm. Um, the PPP and the LDIL, uh, is it E D I L? Yeah, yeah, I think. Programs, yeah. Um, what is going on with them? You clarified one thing. If you are a 1099, you have been employed uh, with a black owned business, so you, you basically can't qualify them to be the PPP program, right? Right. That, that, that was not allowed. I know you lobbied for it, but, but it wasn't allowed, right? Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, part of, let me just say, this, this, this whole process was to keep employees on the books of their employer. The idea was we would give, the government would give your tax dollars back to the employer to make sure that they didn't lay their employees off uh, or furlough them or cut their hours. So the idea was to give you two months of your payroll so that you could keep your people on board until we hopefully got out of this process. There was a $2 trillion package that came out uh, a few weeks ago. Everybody was excited about it. I wasn't. Uh, of that amount of money, of the $349 billion that everybody was talking about, 50 firms took $250 billion of that. So there was only $100 billion left wow. of the entire package. And the majority of those 50 firms were publicly traded firms, like the ones that we've all heard of, Frisch, uh, Roosevelt Frisch Steakhouse and but I with small businesses. How do they define a small business? The definition of small business is really 500 employees or fewer. Right. So that is a wide range of, and then if you're a franchisee, they don't count the total numbers, they just count the number of each one of those franchisees. And so right. many restaurant chains that you saw around the country were taking advantage of it by applying for each one of their locations, collectively going after the money. So that's why you saw some of these chains getting up to, you know, upwards of $10 million. Uh, but they were, because of advocacy, because of the citizens of the country said, no, why should they get the money? Many of them returned those dollars. Now, we understood that the big companies were gonna get that money up front. Right. This package that's coming out uh, that actually was signed uh, yesterday by the president is really geared more towards the small business owner, the self-employed, uh, the 10 and fewer employee businesses. That's where we have to participate and make sure that we are ready. Uh, there were some guidelines in this that kept us uh, out of play. And the first one was you had to go back to your existing bank, your bank uh, and your loan officer. Well, the majority of black businesses don't have a loan officer. No. We may have a teller that we know. Um, we right. have a check account, perhaps, you know, maybe a debit card. I don't have a loan officer, right? I, I, but I know my teller really well, and he knows you know me. You know your teller. And, and you we conduct our business with ease because we have a friendship. But that's the extent have of a friendship. Right. But that teller can't say, yes, George, I have your PPP money here. 
that has to go through a loan officer. And most black people did not know and didn't have a relationship with a loan officer. So by the time we heard that there was going to be a PPP or an IDLE program, we had to go establish a relationship at a bank. And oh yeah, guess what? The bank was closed because of social distancing. So now I got to go online. Many of us didn't have the access to the online information that we needed. So by the time we got through the process, the money was gone. Yeah. I'm telling people it now. Okay, so it was gone in 12 days, right? So, yeah. And, and for those that are listening, the money that is going to hit tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. will more than likely be gone by Tuesday night. So for those of you that are listening, I tell you this, uh, and I really mean this, go to your bank yesterday. Make sure uh, that you have your documentation, that you're filling out the information online, that you're calling them, that you're following up, um, because that is the process. You have to have a relationship with the bank. You already gotta be in the queue, and those businesses that have received some notification from their banks, uh, saying, yes, we've received it. We're just waiting on the funding to drop. Those are the businesses that will get the funding coming out in these next uh, three to seven days, three to five yeah. days. So it's not going to last very long, but are they going to focus on small businesses, you think, or is it just going to be same old stuff? Two answers. Yes, they will focus on small businesses that are already in the queue, George. Um, and then those businesses that aren't in the queue, or let's say get denied, what they need to do is go find what's called a, a CDFI, a Community Depository Investment Financial, a financial institution. That's a black bank. That's a, a local CDFI uh, that's a non-traditional lender. Those are the folk, we carved out $60 billion of that money and put in their hands. And so those small, business bankers are now saying we have funds that have not been allocated. That's where we as a community need to go find them. Black banks, uh, many of them are certified SBA lenders. They understand many of our challenges and they're looking for our relationships. We did a survey uh, last year and found out that only 33% of black people have a credit card. So this is the time for us to establish banking relationships because George, this isn't going to be the last pandemic. We're going to see uh, situations like this in the future. And if we don't have those relationships that we can call on those banks to get involved, we're going to once again be left out. There will be perhaps another round of funding uh, coming on uh, in the next two to three weeks. I tell our businesses now, now is the time to go establish who you are, establish your paperwork, make sure that you're getting in front of the situation. Uh, there will be some contract opportunities as well that come out of this because this is really more of an infrastructure uh, stimulus package to try to come back in many of the cities uh, and towns across the country that have really need uh, infrastructure. And this president has been talk talking about an infrastructure bill for a long time. This may be the opportunity for him uh, to do some of that. And it may be our opportunity as well to get involved with some of these contracts coming down the line. And I was looking at some um, U.S. Census Bureau um, black business statistics, the last, uh, they report them every five years. Mm -hmm. And so your numbers were spot on. They report uh, 2.6 million black owned businesses over the last five year reporting period, an increase of about 40, about 35%. They also report that there, of the 2.6 million Black-owned businesses, only 111,000 of them have employees. And those that have employees, their growth um, in terms of number of businesses is up about 17%. And the average annual revenue of those 111,000 businesses is about 1.3 million a year, and that's up 82%. So that's the good side. <clears throat> That says then, on the downside, is that leaves 2.59 million sole proprietorships. That's up about 125%. Much of that are uh, is really 
black women starting new businesses, about 40% of that, about black women starting new businesses. But the average annual revenue of these sole proprietorships, Ron, is about $18,700 a year, which is below the poverty line. That number is down by 11%. This pro and and you you just said the statistics. It's probably those sole proprietorships, in spite of the growth, that forty percent of those are not going to return to business. There's no money for sole proprietorships. Is there money for sole proprietors? Yes. Uh, so the PPP, and this is what I want to tell people. Um, this is where I think we have an opportunity to participate uh, as a sole proprietor. You can apply for the PPP as well as a sole proprietor what they will allow you to do is to take your annualized income so let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year you pay yourself a hundred thousand dollars you amortize your payroll to yourself eighty three hundred dollars a month you multiply that times two and a half so you're going to come out with somewhere around seventeen eighteen thousand dollars that can be your money the critical thing twofold 75% of that money needs to go back to your payroll. And people, you have to be able to document that you paid yourself. Because if you can't document where that money was gone by the end of June, then you have to pay it back. So I want to tell people this ain't, oh, I got a check from the federal government. Uh, I'm going to go buy, uh, you know, some new equipment or I'm going to go buy a new car. You have to demonstrate how these these funds have been utilized, and if you can't, the government is notorious for coming back, knocking on our door, asking for that money back with interest and penalties. So, so that's yeah, good. This is a, so sole proprietors can, but you have to doc. But you should be able to document that with your tax with your tax forms and all that, right? Sure. As long as we are doing that, then yes. But I know my community many times will say one thing on paper uh, and be well intended, but just don't have the backup documentation when it's time to actually have to present it. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's good. That's good. Um, what is the political, the current political vibe in DC right now? And where are the opportunities for black people in spite of all of this stuff? That's a good question, George, because I mean, we've all heard the whole saying we don't have permanent friends or permanent interest, uh, enemies, just permanent interest. And for me, um, and in Washington, D.C., I really feel that to be the case. What I have attempted to do since I've been here is to be able to take policy that is created in Washington, D.C., and create a relevance to the local business or citizen in the local community. Mm -hmm. So often, we think there's a disconnect like, well, what happens in Washington, D.C. doesn't really impact me unless it's a time to vote or maybe during the census. And I try to tell people there are things happening every day in Washington, D.C. that can make or break you. Um, but because of the fact that we're not educated on it and not even so much in education, it's just it's a communication gap. We're not talking to each other. We're not sharing it and making it relevant to us. I'll give you a great example. When this PPP came out, the white firms had conversations with their clients early on because they said, hey, you got to have go to your existing bank. They were able to call their clients on the phone. They were able to call their banker on the phone, get the information and make uh, the deals flow. For us, we had to wait until we saw it on the news, get it a couple times on the radio and then act. We've got to be more proactive and we have to understand things that are happening here are relevant to you there. And there's gotta be people in the middle like myself and you, George, that can actually uh, convert policy into something that's relevant. So I think the, the, the atmosphere, the tone here in Washington, DC right now, uh, under normal circumstances, you'd see you know, your two candidates out around the country telling their stories, campaigning, having large rallies and, and, uh, of the sorts. You won't see that this time around. So it's gonna be even that much more critical for us to be connected, to understand where our values and priorities are. Uh, I think under times of stress like this, you also get to see le good leadership. You good 
you get a chance to see uh, how pe people act under stress. You get to see a lot about their decision making. And we've seen it every day on the news here over these last couple of weeks that this is a volatile uh, leadership team that we have right now. And I think it's up to America to make a decision on where we're going to go. I don't think this is a black or a white thing right now. I really do believe it is a uh, big money versus average citizen conversation. And when we see that collectively, especially as black people, I think we have the numbers, we have the influence as well as the relationships oh, yeah. to be influential. And then I think the other thing is, we don't look outside of our boundaries of America to see where prosperity lies. And I really believe that this is a global conversation. And as you see black people around the globe, really starting to work together, communicate to each other. There is not a thing that we have to worry about as black people because we have the numbers, we have the intellect, uh, as well as the relationships. We just got to start to build on those. And over the last eight years, you've seen a lot more black people visiting the continent of Africa, uh, <clears throat> facing their roots to Africa, talking about opportunities across the diaspora. And I really believe there's more opportunity for black businesses outside of the United States as much as it is here in the United States. So we just yeah. gotta really look at how we move uh, when we come out of this as well on the, on, the, on the political side. Yeah, no, that's that's hugely important. Um, how, do, how can people join the chamber? What You want them to join their local black chamber? Is that how that works? To tell us how people can get in touch with you and, and, and again, if you could wave a magic wand and have um, our, our viewing audience take an action step or two, what would it be? First off, I would love for your audience to, to go to our website, uh, US Black Chambers, usblackchambers.org, and I'm sure you'll see it there uh, on your social media posts. Uh, we're an advocacy organization that's working on behalf of black people. No question about it, we're unapologetically black, and our voice around the country needs to be heard here as well as locally. So if you're a local business, uh, join your local black chamber. Um, if you're a local entrepreneur, we're interested in having your membership, we're interested in supporting you. If you're doing business outside of your just local community and you're trying to do business across the country or across the globe, join the US black chamber. Uh, uh, again, we do national reach for large businesses you well have as a membership program you have a the, the u.s black chamber has a membership program there's you can join yeah. the u.s black chamber like yes, you, you can, can join, join us like right mm -hmm. yes so 150 dollars, just like you join any other uh, association as a member uh, and that goes a long way um for us as well as for you because when you have an opportunity uh to look at expanding your business or you need capital or you need your voice heard, that's what we do. Um, and if you're a larger business, we have our president circle, but I would love for everyone first to go uh, at least log onto our website, see the things that we're doing in reference to the CARES Act, uh, it's usblackchambers.org backslash CARES dot, uh, backslash CARES dash act. Um, we got resource guys there, we got access to capital, we got uh, introductions to the black owned banks around the country because we really feel like we need to have them sustainable and we would love to see more black people banking with other black banks spending yeah. other money with black owned businesses uh, and we would ultimately just ask everybody to support other black owned businesses around the country sure 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 brother bedford did we have any burning questions that, 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 that popped out before we uh let Ron go. We we still have a we, we really basically have one minute, but we, we if, if there's something burning, yeah, uh, <laughs> time flies. Uh, Linda, she definitely hit me and said, you know, wow, five minutes left. Ron, you covered a lot of ground uh, with a lot of the questions. Um, I'm sure there's some specific things that people would like to know, um, but I think you covered so much. My yeah. my request, George, would be probably with the because we do have quite a few questions, but they're kind of in the ballpark of some of the things that you were touching on. Things like, uh, what did you say about 1099? 
uh, I do not have any employees. You kind of covered that, but they want some more specific action steps on what they need to do. So we may have to have you back and do a Q&A because we have around 20 questions here that are kind of all around in that space. One question is kind of outside of that periphery though, uh, and you just kind of touched on it when you mentioned Africa. A uh, young lady wanted to know what type of business opportunities do you see coming up out of this pandemic? That's a great question. So first off, 40% of all black businesses are in the industries that are hit the hardest. Mm. Hospitality, uh, leisure, beauty, uh, uh, nightclubs, entertainment. So a couple of things that we're doing at the U.S. Black Chamber, each week we are having industry sector conversations. So we will have a uh, industry conversation on restaurants and we'll show restaurant owners from across the country that are having challenges as well as successes. And we'll talk about where there is policy that will help and then as well as what is the future of that industry. And so uh, over the course of the next eight weeks, you'll see us doing uh, hair care, salons, you'll see us doing restaurants, you'll see us doing retail, hospitality, uh, and entertainment in reference to nightclubs and so forth. We feel like there are going to be as many business ideas that come out of this as there will be that are currently going through it. Second thing, I want people to understand two things. One, you hear a lot of folks talking about, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. Yes, we are. But we need to understand this isn't the last pandemic. This isn't the last scare. I tell Black people, we have a better chance at going out of business by being hacked. Just on my laptop, wow. if I'm hacked as a Black business owner, 95% of the chance I'm going out of business. There ain't no reboot refresh, I'm done. I'll give you a good funny story. A friend of mine, a uh, basketball player in, in the NBA, has a brother uh, who got pulled over uh, after leaving a game, uh, had his cell phone with him. The police officer said, oh, you have an outstanding warrant. Uh, they took him, to, took him to jail, booked him, and he said, okay, well, let me just call my brother and get out. When they took his cell phone, he couldn't remember any cell phone. He couldn't remember <laughs> any numbers. He had to stay in jail for 30 days because he couldn't remember a phone number. How many of us have all of our information uh, on a laptop or on a desk that isn't backed up? If And when that happens, it's over for us. We need to have better thought plans of how we're going to get through this, but more importantly, what are we going to do when we come out of this so that we don't have this type of scare in the future? Hospitality is going to be critical. Maybe now we'll be doing more uh, uh, Airbnbs than hotels because of the fact that we now feel like I'm safer in someone's home. Transportation took a big hit, but there's gonna be a different type of transportation. Uber Eats is one of the fastest growing markets right now. While restaurants are suffering, Uber Eats came out. What's wrong with having a black Uber Eats or a black mobile salon industry or a black uh, hair care product line that, that's mobile that can come meet you where you are. We need to think about things that are outside the norm and how we can do business more on the internet going forward, um, but also how to make sure that we are taking care of the, of the information that's on the internet so that if and when a scare does happen, we'll make sure that uh, we have sustainability. That, that's awesome. George, George, I have one more question before <laughs> we get ready to go in. And this is kind of, you touched on this earlier, uh, Ron, and you and I talked about this a couple years ago, uh, but you talked about your own personal experience, the opportunity for acquisition. Uh, a lot of people, when they come to me, come to George, everybody has an idea and they want to start their businesses from the ground up. Can you just kind of give us a, I know you can't do a deep dive on this, but the opportunities for acquiring business in this climate coming up. Yeah, I think, Businesses are going to be available. Real estate is going to be available. There are going to be firms out here that are going to say, I took a hit financially. I got to let it go. Uh, and there are going to be tremendous amounts of opportunity. That's why I say having a great banking relationship is first and foremost for most black businesses because when the opportunity presents itself, it's not that you just got to have money. 
-hmm. but you got to have a relationship with a bank that can get you the money that you need to be able to grow your idea. I'm not one of the believers that says, I want multiple streams of income. I'm a believer in saying, I want to put all of my efforts into this stream of income and make it be the best stream I can be. And in order to be able to do that, I got to take advantages of the opportunities. I have to have good relationships with financial institutions. And I got to keep my head down working hard uh, and making sure that I'm making the best relationships I can around the country as well as around my local communities. That's awesome. Yeah, it's good. Good, good advice. Good, good, good advice. Well, well I knew it. I, I knew you would be a hit. <laughs> and uh, I knew you would give us some very valuable and timely information. Uh, I think for all of you brothers and sisters out there that have sole proprietorships, and that's the overwhelming majority of our, of our businesses, at least at this moment, uh, he gave us some powerful information on how you can qualify uh, for the PPP, even as a sole proprietor. Um, but you got to have your paperwork uh, right, and you got to get on it now. Um, and most of that money, if you properly, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's, most of that money will be forgivable. So take, um, as Ron said, it's going to hit, it's going to hit the banks tomorrow or Monday. Uh, I think the president signed it, what, yesterday? So uh, there's money out there to be had. You just have to be diligent. You have to do the work. Uh, you have to focus, 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 because it is intense and time sensitive. Uh, you're going to have to wait and get, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you know, they're going to put you on hold. I just know from the stuff that we have been doing from our offices in getting all of our paperwork in. It's, uh, but, but it's there and uh, you need to take advantage of it. So whether you're a sole proprietor, whether you are employed, you have employees that you pay, um, do the paperwork, get the money. It's there for you. And they're looking as hard for you as you are looking for them. Uh, the, the heat is on for some of that to dribble down to uh, small businesses, especially uh, black owned businesses. And we certainly deserve it. Um, Ron, I, I can't thank you enough, man. This was really great, awesome information. Um, as uh, Brother Bedford had suggested, uh, we may even have you back to begin the process of just answering questions, some of the questions. And I, you covered most of the stuff that people are ask, ask questions on. But, you know, uh, the key to learning is simplicity and repetition. Sometimes you just have to keep repeating it, repeating it, and repeating it. And, uh, but, 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 we may look for a date to, to bring you back uh, in the future if you would be so kind to do this is valuable time fortunately um uh, we have a little time right now and why not teach and why not reach out to our people and why not reach out to the community you have probably put in to the pockets and ultimately the bank uh of uh at, at least several hundred black folk who are watching uh, out of the thousands that are watching, that may amount to two, three, four, five hundred million dollars, just in some of the simple tips and, and information that you unpack for us. So thank you for that. Um, brothers and sisters, for those of you who know the Power Networking Conference, you know that at each of these podcasts, we do a crazy offer. We limited it to five people. Uh, I apologize to those because uh, every, every, uh, Every podcast, it goes over five. So if you don't hear from me, you know that you went over the five. When you do hear from me, because you hear from me directly, it is simply, hi, this is Dr. Fraser. You've won the lottery. That's really how I, <laughs> when I call you, that's what I said. You sound so, like the PPP. You sound like the SBA, George. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Forbes magazine named the Power Networking Conference one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed. Um, there will be over a thousand attendees. As you know, we moved the conference to October the 14th through the 15th. Uh, it was just the safest and smartest thing to do being that we have the highest propensity um, to die uh, from the coronavirus. But there will still be over a thousand attendees at the, um, 
Hilton of Americas in Houston, Texas. Ron has blessed us with his presence and his presentation and his brain power on many a, a number of occasions at the Power Networking Conference. So there will be a thousand attendees this year. There'll be 50 speakers, 40 workshops of, uh, for intensive training. As you know, we are a training conference. We do not pontificate ad nauseum about our issues. We really uh, get down in the weeds and we are about training and really just two areas, business development and economic development financial education, financial literacy, and bringing our people up to speed <clears throat> with what we need to know about capitalism and the proper management of accumulated wealth. So we talk about wealth, we talk about business building, whether you want to start a business, whether you want to help grow your business, uh, whether you are looking to make connections to develop strategic alliances, joint ventures or partnerships, that's what we're about. There are over 30 interactive spaces at the conference. There are two stages, there are four meals, and it's one amazing experience. It's a life-changing experience. So the offer is good for the first five people. You, I'm going to tell you how you're going to get it and how I'm going to determine who they are. Uh, 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 it's real simple, but let me tell you what the offer is. This is the flyer. You can go right to Power Networking Conference dot com www.powernetworkingconference.com and see the entire schedule it's a beautiful website all the workshops all the speakers everything is on that schedule on, on the website so an adult registration for our conference is fifteen hundred dollars if you met one person as i like to say that could help change the trajectory of your business or life would that be worth fifteen hundred dollars absolutely it would be worth it you're going to meet more than one person. We encourage all of our grown folk to bring a young person. We should be conferencing with our young people so they could sit at the feet of masters like Ron Busby. So we have a student price. It's $800. So $800 and $1,500, a student in you is $2,300. So for five people, who will win the lottery tonight. We're going to reduce that by $1,900 and reduce the price for you, an adult, and a young person, 17 to 25, to $399. It costs us more than that to feed you in a five-star luxury hotel. So the first five people, here's how it goes. You email me, gfraser at frasernet.com. That's G. Fraser at FraserNet.com. Put in the subject line, I'm in. Put your name and your cell number in the body and email me at gfraser at FraserNet.com. The first five people that do it get that special offer. I will then call you personally and we will chat and we will close the deal. So that's our offer. Um, get on it now, take advantage of it. Uh, again, I want to close by saying, Brother Bedford, always great. Great to see you and great to be with you. And Ron, yes, sir. you are the bomb.com. <laughs> really, you, you're just a generous, woke, conscious brother. And we are lucky to have you running the U.S. Black Chamber. I hope you I hope you retire there. I, I can't envision you. I, I can't envision you doing anything else. Your, that's your legacy. That's going to be your legacy, right? You're going to have a marble statue in Washington, D.C., right, as the legacy leader of the U.S. Black Chamber. So we love you, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and, you. Uh, um, and join us. Uh, Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday with Randall Pinkett. Dr. Randall Pinkett. Thing, Randall, man. I, I had him speak at my conference a few years back, George, as you can remember. Uh, and he was a huge draw and just a wealth of information. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing him uh, uh, next week as well. Randall's a beast, Rhodes Scholar. Yes. And yeah. uh, he used to he used to, to, to talk a lot about um, you know, he was the first black person to win 
the apprentice, the real yeah. apprentice. Yeah. Not the celebrity apprentice. Yeah. Right. The real brain power. He he won the he he won the first black person to bring that apprentice in. He's just an incredible mind and an incredible personality, woke and conscious like brother brother Ron. So he'll be with us on Tuesday. So uh, brothers and sisters, thank you. You have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. We went a little bit over with a special guest. So Ron, thank you. You be good, everybody. Good night. Good night. Take care, Ron. Thank, thank you, Brother Pepper. Talk so. Good deal. All right. Great job, my brother. <laughs>